Good afternoon to those that are just joining us for the talk. Uh, for those that may know not, may know not me, um, my name is Adriana Alvarez Nico. I'm uh, vice president to the Hong Kong Art Gallery Association and founder of Puerta Roja Gallery. Um, and I'm thrilled to uh, introduce today um, a panel that basically has not only decades of international experience uh, in terms of curatorial work, museum, um, and Biennale's work, uh, but a huge amount of passion for art. Um, following uh, the very, very colorful uh, comments <laughs> by Cedar Tang, um, I would like to start by introducing and extending, <clears throat> sorry, a very, very warm welcome to Hong Kong, to Suhania Rafael, the new executive director of M Plus. Um, <laughs> And um, I guess uh, the best introduction I can make, especially after C. David's uh, comments, um, that Suyana, when she got appointed, said, the art world without controversies would be a dull place. Bring it on. So <laughs> I hope you can respond to some of the comments that he made. Um, Suhania uh, um, comes from Hong, uh, to Hong Kong after being the deputy director and director of collections at the Art Gallery of New South Wales in Australia. She also held many curatorial positions at the Queensland Art Gallery and the Gallery of Modern Art in Brisbane. She led the Asia Pacific Triennial and the China Project, amongst many others. She's also curatorial advisor to the Yokohama Triennial, and she was member of the Asian Art Council of the Guggenheim Museum. I would also like to introduce Yong Wu Li. Um, he is now executive director of the Shanghai Himalayas Museum and president of the International Biennial Association. He was also founding director and the president of the Foundation of the One Year Biennial, professor at the, Shanghai uh, at the Shanghai University and also at Tokyo University of Art. He has curated multiple exhibitions, which I could not list, and he has also published several books of amazing great artists such as Nam Jun Pak. Um, Sir David Elliott, you've had, uh, for those of you that have uh, uh, had the opportunity to listen to his talk, uh, would be uh, very difficult to introduce, but as a very quick summary, he's an extremely prolific curator, writer, and professor. He was director of museums in Oxford, Stockholm, Tokyo, and Istanbul. And he's currently chairman of the Triangle Art Network, chairman of Momentum in Berlin, and also a visiting professor in curatorship to the Chinese University in Hong Kong. Today, they're going to be talking about how to engage audiences in museums, biennales, and triennials. And I'm thrilled to also uh, present the moderator of the talk today, Elaine Ng, who is editor and publisher of Art Asia Pacific. She has been a juror of a long list of very important prizes and curated programs all around the world. Um, and she currently is also part of the advisory board of Asia Art Archive. So with that, Hello. Okay. So first, I'd like to thank Hong Kong Art Week for inviting me to uh, moderate today's panel with our distinguished panelists, uh, David Elliott, uh, Lee Yong Wu, and Suhanya Rafael. Um, we'll be talking about building and engaging audiences in museums, as well as art festivals, including biennials and triennials. I believe that this conversation could also apply to building and engaging audiences for commercial galleries, as well as art in general here in Hong Kong, a relatively fledgling art scene. We'll be looking at strategies for engaging audiences across a range of institutions, as well as from different geographical contexts, and how these differ and overlap. For public art institutions, small, medium, or large, audience engagement is a top priority, especially if funded with taxpayer money. To clinch any kind of significant corporate sponsorship for an arts organization or an art event, sponsors rarely give for altruistic reasons, but rather as brand building exercises. Invariably, this means broadening audiences to ensure there are hundreds of thousands of people looking consciously or subconsciously at their logos. 
to some curators, building audiences can elicit eye rolling or even a mild sense of dread. Imagine, just where are we going to hang the green Starbucks lady in our Greek and Roman galleries? I don't know. Do you know, Suhanya? <laughs> Thomas Hoving, the director of the Metro Metropolitan Museum of Art from 1967 to 1977, was considered notorious among his colleagues because he transformed what was largely an insular, elitist institution into an outward-looking, populist museum. He initiated museum practices that today are considered normal, including draping banners along the museum facade that advertise the current exhibitions, and organizing summer blockbuster shows, including the first US exhibition of the Egyptian treasures from the tomb of King Tut. While Hoving transformed the museum as we know it by drawing millions from across New York City, the US, and around the world, to the Met, he had plenty of detractors and critics. Today, institutions around the world are often under fire by artists, curators, art critics, and other serious art world figures. They say museums are increasingly pandering to mass audiences with shows such as Italian Jewels, Bulgari style, at the National Gallery of Victoria and Melbourne, Bjork at New York's Museum of Modern Art, uh, Studio Ghibli animation layouts at the Museum of Contemporary Art in Tokyo, and DreamWorks animation at the Seoul Museum of Art. Some would ask, how low can the bottom line sink to? I've given this background to illustrate how there are two sides to engaging audiences, the popular on one hand and the elitist on the other. Some of the questions I hope to discuss are how to maintain a balance between a challenging discourse and something that is not only for insiders, but can attract and welcome new audiences, as well as have us think more profound, profoundly about art. How to keep the audience's attention. And finally, how to be relevant to both art and institutional history and tradition on one hand, and to the globalized, digitized, instant gratification of the present on the other. And since we know all of your biographies, I don't have to go over this again, but David, I'd like to start with you. Um, you've led museums in many different countries and organized exhibitions around the world. Um, how have you approached audience engagement in each of those settings? Um, is it always a kind of one size fits all approach, or do you adapt and engage with the audience based on the context? Well, I think there's two things we're talking about. One, one is the audience, um, and then the other is what you show to the audience. Now, what I show to the audience isn't the same thing um, in, um, in Tokyo as it would be in Stockholm or Oxford, for instance. And Oxford and Stockholm are quite different too. It's, uh, I don't believe there is the, the exhibition of good art to be found like some sort of holy grail and you just parachute it down you know, into Phnom Penh or somewhere and the, you know, the natives will, will, will bow and wonder at it. No, I don't think that's true at all. Um, but that's for me about context, uh, cultural context, and it's about also architectural context, the buildings. And, um, and also privileging the artists who are living around you. I mean, they should get the first look in. So it means a process of learning uh, on behalf of the curator, which is normal. Curators who don't learn are lousy curators. And they should be always getting bigger, their knowledge. Um, but, but I don't think audiences essentially are different. Uh, once you allow for the difference of contents, they're human beings. And if you treat to them, uh, talk to them in a tone of voice that isn't condescending, uh, which isn't arrogant, you talk to them in a way that is actually saying, look, I think this go is good, and I'd like to share it with you. I think that's attractive. And I don't think people are not interested in art. I'm not particularly interested in them. I mean, that if they... Uh, if, if, I know they can come to exhibitions for many different reasons. I wouldn't kick them out. 
But, but I think one's talking to people who have a concern for art. It's an art museum, art exhibitions, and it's made for them. And it's actually showing that the art is intelligent and well done. It's good art. And I have the same expectations of the audience. And there are plenty of people out there. They might not have specialist knowledge, but they can respond to that because it's not excluding them. It's an open way of communicating. Can I just add that um, we probably need to also realize that there are many kinds of audiences um, when we talk about audiences and that museum practice has changed vastly over, well, when I think about the Art Gear of New South Wales, I mean, it was established almost 140 plus years ago. That was where I was last. A museum then, and you can look at the architecture, a museum was a keeper. It was holding things in. Um, and people are expecting much more from museums now as well, equally. So when once it was a place that was very elite, it was a place where um, deep scholarship was practiced for one's colleagues. Um, and that's not saying that's bad. I think that's a very, very good thing to do. But the contemporary museum has a very different place in a society. And how that's communicated is what we're also practicing. So we're looking at different kinds of audiences, young audiences, older audiences, audiences that are deeply engaged, audiences that come for entertainment, David. I caught your, your, your lecture. And they do, they come for a leisure experience that has learning as part of it. So you have multiple audiences that are expecting very different kinds of experiences within the art museum. How, and so the art museum has in fact become a very complex, quite sophisticated in the way it engages the, uh, in the exercise of communicating art. Yeah. Working with artists, fundamentally, I think, for most of us mm -hmm. in any art institution, even when you're looking at art from many, many centuries ago, to work with a living artist is an honor and a privilege and a window into art that is unique. And people respond, any people respond. And I think that is a huge advantage that we have when we are working with art museums. Mm. You wanted to say something? Else? Yeah, just, just to add to that, really, that I think if it's a public museum, we're talking about That's public museums, museum. I think that they've been quite weak in explaining to the public or communicating to anyone, and this includes to politicians, why they're special. Too often they're seen like a, a little poodle trotting along after the, uh, the backside of the market, you know, yapping, saying, me too, me too. Can't quite afford that, sorry. Whereas they have great, great resources. And they're, this is where the research comes in, very important. And if they're doing their work and they're looking out, and this is a great opportunity now in, in plus, because, of, I mean, the still Southeast Asia is in the process of becoming, it's not all bought up yet. Um, you can get things before the market does. And, and I think that is part of the game. So I have a, talking about encyclopedic museums, I have a, a question for you. Um, encyclopedic museums like the Met in New York or the Los Angeles County Museum or the Art Gallery of New South Wales in Sydney, um, they're traditionally known as crowd pleasers. Audiences flock to them to see masterpieces and to learn about different art periods and art from different cultures and eras. In the last couple of years, all-encompassing museums such as the Met and LACMA have been making a really strong push for contemporary exhibitions and developing their contemporary art departments and collections. I want to know what was the motivation behind the Sydney project for the Art Gallery of New South Wales. Do you see general audiences shifting their focus towards contemporary art? Uh, or is this a reflection of the fact that contemporary is, you know, now moving back in time, as it were, and and you know, much a much larger part of the art consciousness of today. So, for those of you who might not realize, the Art Gallery of New South Wales in Sydney, one of the oldest art institutions for the country, is 
currently undergoing a project of expansion, doubling its space. Um, and in a very local context, Brisbane in Queensland, where I used to work prior to going to Sydney, did that very project. It, it doubled its space and has what's called the Gallery of Modern Art. The National Gallery in Victoria in Melbourne did the same, as did Canberra. So Sydney um, has a very wonderful museum with a beautiful collection, deep collection, but a very small space, half the size of all the others in Australia. And as we were saying earlier, museum, museums are competitive institutions in the world now. And the desire to bring exhibitions to its local audiences is, is extremely important. It's one of the key drivers of what museums do. And um, as David was saying, it's very conscious of what hasn't been seen in a place, wanting to bring that to that place, working with your colleagues internationally. So one of the key drivers for Sydney was to have a space that could do that. The Art Gallery of New South Wales, because it has been growing its collection, and it's a, a wonderful, broad collection from historical Asian art, Victorian paintings, a, a, a very significant collection of Australian art from colonial times all the way through, needs to give space to those collections. Collections are the long, slow release of who we are into the future. It really matters what collections do. And I and my colleagues at the Agar of New South Wales hate to take down the collection to make space for the big temporary exhibition. And that was what was happening in Sydney. And we felt that that was a, a, an immense compromise for the people of New South Wales who owned that collection, that that collection needed to be seen all the time, and we needed to have space to be able to show exhibitions from all over the world, from all time. So it wasn't particularly driven by a contemporary agenda, even though contemporary art is very much a part of the Art Gallery of New South Wales collections, and it's a contemporary international and national collection. So that was what was driving that agenda in Some people Sydney. have said that the Met is shifting to mm. draw new audiences yeah. in the contemporary audience. Yeah, but um, it, I'm, we were talking about this earlier, that contemporary art, why is contemporary art so popular? I think it's very popular because it, it speaks immediately to us. We are in our time. And that's why people are able to recognize it. They find it much harder to read, you know, a Victorian painting, one of those sad pictures that comes out of the UK, um, or um, 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 a Himalayan bronze, you know, which had a very different purpose when it was made in the fifth century. So um, it needs much more work for people to understand and begin to engage with work from a, a, another time. So contemporary art, there's a sort of a wink of recognition, even if one doesn't necessarily always know what that's about. It's At least it's from your time, and one can start to approach it in that way. So, you know, there is definitely a sense that more people are looking at art more than ever. But if you look at the history of the public museum, it's a very recent phenomenon. Most of our big international museums, whether it's the Hermitage or um, the Louvre, they are imperial collections. They belong to an elite and were really have a bigger history of loot and you know, it's a it's a, an, an empire that make those collections. I don't think they'll ever happen again. They are from a certain time and place, those particular museums. So we are seeing a growth in museum industries also because those big museums have been slowly making big art available to a broad public. And 
it matters. That's why I am in a public institution and have always dedicated my life to public institutions because the public matters, audiences matters, and audiences engaging with art matter a lot. I'd like to ask um, Young Wu a question about audiences and, and um, shifting it away from museums to biennials. You were involved with the Guangzhou Biennial from the very beginning in 1995. And Guangzhou is a small city compared to Seoul or Shanghai or Sydney. And Guangzhou is it's known for its agriculture, its food, its university, and for being less developed compared to the other five major cities in South Korea. Uh, the first time I ever attended a Guangzhou Biennale was in 2002. And what impressed me then and what continues to impress me is how the whole city comes out to support the Biennale. I was looking at the audience figures over the years for the Guangzhou Biennale, and I was really struck by the first year's figures. Over 1.6 million people came out in 1995 for the Guangzhou Biennale. Paid visitors. Paid visitors. Um, it's a number that has never been matched since, although under Young Wu, his, the average was about half a million people would come to the Guangzhou Biennale. Um, I want to know, how did you manage to draw so many people in that first year? Was it novelty? Was it local pride? Was it amazing marketing? I mean, how did you manage to get not just the art world to come, but also the residents of Guangzhou who are not your typical art audience? Uh, the, the genesis narrative of the Guangzhou it goes back to 1993 when I was thinking of the making an artistic event uh, in Guangzhou uh, in the name of the spirit of resistance. The spirit of resistance is closely related to what happened in 1980, Guangzhou civil uprising. Some of you may know Guangzhou civil uprising, right? Okay. And uh, <clears throat> The making of BNI was not a forced goal, but uh, uh, the, 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 after the ap aftermath of the Guangzhou Civil Uprising, Guangzhou Civil Uprising, as you know, uh, more than 200 citizens and students were victimized. They were, they were shot dead. They're protesting against the military dictatorship and also political repression, 1980. And then, uh, the NGOs and city government, they tried to their best to find a way after mass and then to heal the, the trauma. And then I'm not from Guangzhou, but I was on the front line of the, the civil uprising in 1980. So we're thinking about making an artistic event. Art, we were genuine. We hoped art would be able to heal this kind of wounded heart. And then uh, 1994, we announced the official founding with the Guangzhou Biennale. In 1995, in September, we opened the first edition of the Guangzhou Biennale. And then uh, from the first day, the opening day, uh, we were really amazed at the large number of the audience. The first day, 35,000 people came. 35, not 3,500. So there was no viewing environment at all. So they were just moving in a group inside the exhibition hall, and then 20 pieces of contemporary art pieces have been damaged by them. So we said that uh, contemporary art is, uh, is, is so uh, popular. I would argue with that later. But anyway, so that was a continuous until the end of the uh, Biennale. But the thing is that they, they came, of course, to see the Biennale, but on the other hand, most of the people from Seoul and from the other city, like Busan or Tegu, they had a kind of guilty feeling about towards the democratization movement of the Guangzhou. And then at that very moment, they have not been able to do anything for the citizens of Guangzhou, although they've been killed by the military government. And then they decided to come down to encourage the citizens of Guangzhou. That was a very important factor. And then uh, 1.6 million, can you imagine? They are contemporary art lovers. They are biennial lovers. Are they museum goers, biennial goers? No idea. And then they start to take a look at the contemporary art pieces. And then they said, what is this, by the way? 
because 1993, 1995, at that very particular moment, biennial has been starting to explode with the like a burgeoning discourse of the globalization. But 1993, 1995 was a bit too early. Gwangju Biennale was the oldest Biennale in Asia. And then when it first declared, even I had to explain about the nature of the Biennale. What is the notion of Biennale? It is every two years format artistic event. And then they started learning. So I can say that those 1.6 million audience didn't come to the Biennale itself only, but to encourage the citizens of Gwangju who were victimized through the uh, Gwangju civil uprising. Do you understand that? So, but I can tell you that in the second edition of the Gwangju Biennial, there was a huge reduction of number of audience from 1.6 to 900,000, still a lot. But, uh, and then they found that in a way, Biennale is very boring contemporary art exhibition. <laughs> but they still came. But they still came, of course. So we did all kind of uh, uh, the, 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 the audience uh, examination. I mean, we did a poll. We uh, questioned 1,000 audience asking about how they received the Biennale, how was the contemporary art for them, because they were the general public. And then if they really enjoyed the contemporary art, or they enjoyed the context of the Biennale, which was the theme of the Biennale was Beyond the Borders. And then the answer was contemporary art is not interesting, it's very boring. And then, of course, they understood there's something going on. As one of the collateral event, collateral event, I curated a show on Picasso, because we brought 28 uh, Guernica studies drawing. And then that room was really packed with the audience. And I was showing uh, Mauricio Catalan, for instance. And then that room was totally empty. Mauricio Catalan. Mauricio Catalan, the Italian artist living in New York now. So he's so popular artist now, but uh, 20, uh, 21 years ago, Mauricio, who was presenting in a very big room, he presented one, uh, the, the dead uh, pigeon at a very corner of the big room. And then... On the second day, one of the cleaner. <laughs> you got that already. It disappeared, of course. And I called Mauricio. It's gone. He said, of course, he said. So leave the empty, the room empty. It's OK. It was not OK. I asked him, and then we brought again. And then uh, one of the Brazilian artists, we prepared like uh, 38 the, the bedrooms. And then people stayed to lay down on the bed. And then they were jumping on it, of course, kids. We just, we've been, you see, educating them. It's not the way that you are supposed to do. But anyway, so at the end of the Biennale, the 48 pieces were broken. So the insurance coverage was huge. I'm telling you the story. Uh, civil revolution, the Biennale in Asia, in early period of 1990s, and then who is the general public? Are they really art lover? Or do, do they love the storytelling of artistic pieces? And then all that. I have another question for you, Young Wu. Um, now that you're at the Shanghai Himalayas Museum, a privately funded institution, uh, can you speak about the differences between public engagement for a private museum in China versus a city-affiliated project like Guangzhou? Um, are there any specific Chinese characteristics you might want to speak about? Uh, that's a tough question. And also, I've been asked that question many times. Uh, the public institutions today uh, uh, stake a claim for the general public, the, the public interest and the public engagement, culture for public. The question is who and how to define the public the general public. One could even aggressively argue that you public institutions have been serving to very limited uh, guests, limited general public, something like uh, bourgeoisies or elite group. But uh, this kind of uh, the, the public, 
the, the nature of the public, it, it is not differentiated uh, monolith. Uh, on the one hand, general public is everyday people. On the other hand, everyday people who are interested in some particular area, like art and music, with discipline. In China, for instance, I, I recently organized uh, a exhibition. Uh, it's not an exhibition, but a Shanghai project co-curated by myself and the Hansel Leo Brist. And then intentionally, I, we didn't organize an exhibition in the first phase of the Shanghai project. We made a community participation program. Community participation program is closely related to the general public. And uh, the, the result is pretty good. We get, uh, in average, like a weekend, uh, 5,000 audience per day. And then in a weekday, 1,500, something like that. It's a still big audience. But as you know, the population of Shanghai is like almost 30 million. Uh, it's, it's, it's like a, one of these state population in Europe. So uh, I'm not talking about Shanghai project itself is very popular. But uh, if you are able to understand about how the audience are real, they respond, to today's, not only contemporary, but to the artistic practice and event, like a festival or any kind of event. Uh, doing a private museum job as a director, it, it's very, very tough. When I'm organizing this uh, Shanghai project, I had lots of the public museum directors' friends, and then they say we are really suffering from the shortage of money. And then I have been learning as a director of the private museum, I'm suffering from the money, I'm suffering from the curatorial independence. And when I was doing this uh, Shanghai project, I'm also suffering from something like uh, the, the authoritative uh, uh, supervision, let's say. I don't want to directly mention about the term. So many uh, the Chinese museums uh, they are without collection sometimes, and then they, the space sit empty, and uh, they are suffering from the short, shortage of the audience, of course. And then I believe that uh, as a private museum director, I have been experiencing a lot of potential positive chaos in China. I define it as a positive case, which I experienced in 1980s in Korea. So. I'm very much optimistic in a way. So uh, as you can see, like a big titles, China museum boom, which is very true. In Shanghai, I can see like a three private museums being prepared now. They are going to be opening early next year. And then they are going to be sponsored and managed by the very known enterprise. But uh, still, uh, we need to learn. I've been sharing this kind of notion of the audience with the curators and museum directors as well in Shanghai and Beijing. And we, we really need to start to discuss about the audience culture, first of all, rather than making a building or exhibition organizing and all that. Yeah, I think the problem talking about audiences, it's very easy to fall into the language of, of marketing. And um, I mean, the, 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 the equation that you started up, off with that, you know, you have the museum, you have its corporate uh, supporters and sponsors. And to get the sponsorship, you have to get large audiences. This is a nightmare. You're like a hamster in a wheel as soon as you're in that because you've lost all autonomy and, and certain amount of volition. Um, so then you have to give them what they want. Well, if you're dealing with contemporary art, they don't know what they want because it's in the process of becoming. They may think they want any contemporary art. Maybe they do in case of <laughs> Guangzhou, maybe they did. Or maybe they really wanted to show their solidarity in a political way. That's admirable. Um, then they learn something that way. Um, but it, 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 it's a bit, of a, a bit of a nightmare. I just got, like to go on just to talk about the Universal Museum, I agree with you totally that their age is over. They're the age of the dark, from the dark side of the Enlightenment because uh, they were created by Enlightenment rulers mostly and the stuff was stolen from other places. 
and say the Met. I mean, <clears throat> until very recently, I mean, they were extracting things via their collectors out of China, which had no proper provenance and from other places, well, Greece and Rome, like the Getty. Um, and uh, they'd been illegally ex excavated. You know, during the past 10 years, this had been, uh, been happening. And so this kind of robber baron attitude continued in the US into the major museums until very recently. Now they don't, partly because of legal challenge and also because of peer group pressure, quite rightly so. So then I look a little bit at the Met. I mean, I'm, I think it's a great museum and I, 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 it's great that they're doing contemporary art, but it's like they're starting to colonize contemporary art now. They colonize the past. Now they're colonizing the contemporary. And at the same time, they're having this huge financial crisis. They're having to lose lots of staff because the monster has to be fed. And it's fed by the supporters, the corporate ones and the individual supporters. And, and it just gets so big, the monster, it's like a dinosaur. It no longer keep going. And I think these kind of mega museums, their time is coming to, a, to an end in a way. I mean, the ones that are there will focus on their key collections and continue going. And, uh, and the ones dealing with the contemporary, if they keep going, they will cease to be, you know, they'll have modern or earlier collections and they'll have a historical component. And anyway, you can't talk about the contemporary without it being a, a springboard from the past into the future. And that only makes sense. So, so the idea of being purely a strictly contemporary museum, as uh, much of the dogma in the 70s was, you know, après nous le déluge, uh, you just forget about these abstract expressions. So old hat. I mean, it's crazy. I mean, no, this is, this is an organic flowing uh, culture which goes from one place to another randomly across the world. And uh, it's this kind of museum that has that has that elegance and that swiftness, that knowledge and ability to move, will be interesting. We're not quite there yet. I want to tap your um, years of experience with a question about, you know, experiencing the public funding cuts in the 1980s under Margaret Thatcher. Um, mm. You were running a museum at that time. Yeah. And then you witnessed the subsequent growth of the art celebrity and the art market. Mm. Um, can you talk about how to engage an audience with a general awareness about art, um, perhaps sparked by the ludicrous prices fetched at art auctions, art fairs, galleries that grab all the headlines, and an audience that increasingly looks at art yeah. as a commodity? Well. <sighs> I never do. It's not a commodity to me, and uh, I, I'm not actually interested in it as a commodity. I'm not very interested in the art market either, other than, other than when I have, to, have had to engage with it. And um, I'm the last person to ask that question to, really, uh, because of my complete lack of interest in it. The market's a mechanism. It's not a brain. It has no brain. It has no morality. It will merely sell you at a spot price what people, someone is prepared to pay for a certain thing. And that's it. There's no more. It doesn't mean it's any good. Lots of crap things reach high prices. And sometimes, of course, the market and a, a, and a more measured evaluation of quality happen to overlap because a lot of collectors are very smart and they study the, the form very well and they've got good taste. Um, but so should museums. Uh, but, uh, yeah, I, I... I mean, for instance, when I... I've gone to London, and I remember having conversations with taxi drivers who read the Evening Standard, and they'd say, mm. oh, you know, I'd say, take me to the Freeze Art Fair or the Tate. And they said, oh, yeah, you know, can you believe how much people pay for this crap? Mm. You know, but, so they know about art, but they're, it's through a certain kind of... Yeah, this is, this is the, the thing of when we say that more and more people are interested in contemporary art. Maybe they're interested in that way because it's, they're impressed and maybe appalled by the fact it costs so much money. I mean, I think if you look at the, at the demography still of people who go to art museums and get a lot out of it, uh, and in spite of very active education programs, which are very necessary, which bring in kids, young people from many, many different backgrounds, in spite of that, it's still for a very, relatively small part of the population. And, and I think this is, this is the world we live in, and it needs to be, we need to be aware of it. There's no room for complacency. And, and the same thing about, about 
poverty. I mean, the vast majority of people in the world are living in quite serious poverty, and we're okay. And museums are part of our culture. And how do we make it part of a broader culture? And that is not the museums, but that's a more general uh, social and political issue that needs to be fixed. But the museums, perhaps, and artists, perhaps, have a perspective which they can give into that. Just a small aside, really, in terms of that sense of how some artists have responded to market as well in, in the contemporary world. Um, many artists have resisted that by moving their practice directly into the museum and making it a performance-based practice as well. Objects. Yeah, ob yeah, without objects. Just, you know, there are strategies that are constantly being invented by artists that test all kinds of agendas that include market, but also museum. So, Suhani, yesterday we were talking about the National Palace Museum and how In it's Taiwan. kind of mm. flooded by audiences and visitors. Mm. And as a curator and a museum director, I, I want to know if you believe that a bigger audience is a better audience for an institution? I think it's what an institution does with audiences um, because it's, it is a two-way street. It's not a passive thing where a mu museum just sits and audiences come. Um, it, it, it is a dynamic relationship that requires work on both sides and it is an exchange always. And in many um, situations, it's a three-way exchange. It's not just museum audience, it's museum art audience, because museum is also a platform and a framework. And a lot of work now is being done by curators to understand that it's, uh, you know, it's not a, a museum is not a, a void space. It's full of meaning. And there are different ways to construct that meaning. And, uh, and the most interesting curators are structuring those experiences in challenging um, sensational um, experiences as well. They can be uh, sensoriums of, of um, how the work communicates or extremely arid and uh, tough, you know. So you, you get a, a whole range of museum workers working to, to make, to think about how an artist made a work at a particular time and place but also going back to history, going forward into the contemporary. It's um, a constructed space, very much so. And you get audiences starting to learn about it. I've, before I was at the Art Gallery of New South Wales, I spent 20 years at the Queensland Art Gallery working on the Asia Pacific Triennial. And I watched from a, a space that had 30,000 people in, on, in, at that first Triennial in 93, very small audience, grow to being up to a million. And what the learning that Queensland Art Gallery, the, you know, that experience, the learning from that experience was the vast majority of people coming to that exhibition are local and they had learned to come many times because you needed to experience it many times before you could understand and have a rich experience. And that took 20 years of museum work with audience, the audience working with the museum to achieve. Um, a really important thing to say is it, good things take time. I, I wanted to ask whether um, with, your, with the Guangzhou Biennale, as you were doing your um, audience research, whether over the space of time you found that the audience had became an educated one, the general audience. When we did the research about the response of the audience, it was very interesting. First of all, uh, when we conducted the survey, 
on the audience response. Firstly, they said uh, they were very interested in storytelling of the art objects that they view. The storytelling itself is very important for them. The secondly, they re realized the importance of the cultural institutions like the museum and Biennale, where they offer like a cultural food. And then they've been encouraging us to continue that kind of project. If Guangzhou Biennale is suffering from the shortage of the budget, why don't we make a Biennale tax? That was quite encouraging, although it is kind of impossible dream. And uh, the thirdly, uh, they were also responding to the exhibition. Although they said they are interested in uh, storytelling and the importance of the cultural institutions like museum and biennale, they are not directly referred to the contents and context of the exhibition itself. But museums and biennales today, we are very much obsessive in organizing exhibition itself as an eternal production of this institution. It's a very interesting point. So it really depends how we approach towards the exhibition making itself. So the question also goes, there are some criticisms about the, the product of the museums as Biennale today. As you can see, there are many different kinds of international artistic events. In the visual art alone, there are 280 Biennales in the world. 280, which is a striking number. This is the exact number because I have collected all different statistics from related associations and institutions. And there are, as you probably know well, over 300 art fairs and 1,000 film festivals and 3,000 jazz festivals. More astonishingly, there are, in recent 10 years of time, over 100 design weeks all over the world, including Hong Kong Business of Design Week, uh, Moscow Design Week, Milan, London, uh, or Buenos Aires. Anyway, even there is a design month, not week, in Reykjavik in Iceland. So what are these, uh, the meaning? Why there are so many artistic and cultural products as an event? So that question applies to why we, we keep doing this. Is it because of the audience? Of course, we have clients. Events are coming and going, of course, repeatedly. And then the museums, for instance, we don't need all the museums in the world like a turbine hall type of space of the Tate Modern. And then what is the real vocation of the museum? As, is it like a guideline? Is the turbine hall like a guideline? I remember one article uh, came out 1995 in New York Times. It was right after Guggenheim Museum organized Armani Show. And the title of the New York Times was Museums. Go back to art. So do you find the programs of the museums as Biennales becoming pretty homogeneous? We say, we three uh, museum, uh, contemporary museum directors, we don't agree at all because we, we do. We curate something very different. But the critics start to say that programs are more or less homogeneous. It's almost the same repeating all that. So where is the real marginal line of the aesthetic sentimentalism, let's say? Uh, as uh, David said, is, 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 there was a question, is museum like a, almost the same like a shopping mall because museum has to survive to sell the ticket? So talking about power or the independence or autonomy of the general public today, it is very important to recognize them. But on the other hand, what is the autonomy, strategic autonomy of the museums and biennales today? That's also the question. Just wanted to add that museums 
are also part of the real world, you know, and it and we are buffeted, as we all know, by the conditions of a place and a time. So it 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 doesn't sit outside that. So it it is, it reflects those those, the pushes and pulls of a of a time and place. So how much time do we have? Is that it, or do you? We have time for questions. Okay. So any questions from the audience? Uh, firstly, thank you very much for speaking uh, today. Uh, my question is, um, how do you think um, the future of museums will look like with the rise of, say, social technologies and uh, interactive technologies? Uh, thank you. Which one of you are active on social media? I, I am. I am going to. I am. I am an objects person. I believe in the thing, and that we adore those things. And however much there is virtual, it it's a seminal part of who we are. <laughs> we will go back to the object. So. No, I agree with that. Um, social media, digital technology. They're they're a tool, and uh, they may they can help you present things much more clearly and better you get close-ups and things like that but it doesn't replace the thing itself and yep okay Okay, interactive technologies in museums and which children and others can involve themselves in and how that would be used by museums. In fact, has been. Do you want to say something about Brisbane? Yes, um, it's, um, you know, with technology, I just want to just reflect on my own children. They could do type words on a computer before they could write words with their hands. And it was a, a shock <laughs> to see that happen. So there's something about technology, especially with youth, that it, it, there is something about that channel that they can plug into it. I'm, I'm, I think probably from that generation that is a Luddite when it comes to technology. I struggle with it. I've, I use it a lot. I, I understand that it's utterly necessary, but I still struggle with it. But, it. but at the same time, there is a lot of innovation that takes place and, and artists using those technologies to make work as well. And as museums, you have to engage with that. Like I said, artists always test in whatever way. And if you're a museum open to that, you and one hopes to be, um, you are curious. Any other yeah. questions? I, I think it's also very useful for learning um, interactive technologies. It's a very efficient way of learning particular things and facts and how to put facts together and strange links you can make yourself. So you can then begin to create networks of knowledge yourself. And that's incredibly useful. Hi. Um, you made a couple of references to museums feeling pressure to behave like shopping malls. And I just wonder, in a place like Hong Kong, what's your view on museum work or museum quality work being actually shown in shopping malls? Actually, probably Yang Wu, you may know. Some of, in Shanghai, they do this quite a bit. Oh. Art in shopping malls. Art in shopping malls. Saying that museums are like shopping malls, but actually here in Hong Kong, in Shanghai, some shopping malls are showing up. <laughs> well, like shopping malls showing up, but my museum is even inside the shopping mall. <laughs> <laughs> there are many cases like that in China. If you go to Beijing, and there are three museums are preparing. It's an entirely huge shopping mall, and that they're make, making a museum building inside. They say 
R10 artifacts, they can coincide very friendly, which is a good direction. But on the other hand, uh, you will be able to get more audience in a way, collecting the audience. It's like a collecting the audience almost on the street because they are not opinionated audience. And then they just come to the shopping mall and then they find there is a museum, they have a program, and then they just buy the ticket. Or uh, when this year we have done a, one of the popular show, Don Huang. Most of the Chinese people, they understand the important, historical importance of the Don Huang cave painting. And then we have not moved all the mountains from Don Huang, but the, one of the most frequent questions from the audience was that, why these cave paintings are unreal? So I said, we cannot move the mountain to Shanghai from Don Huang, and then those kind of huge gap between understanding about artifacts, understanding about real, unreal, and then way of the presenting artworks in the space of the museum. And uh, we, we started to teach. But uh, on the other hand, uh, there is also this advantage because uh, the museum is uh, like, a, for them, reminiscent a kind of a shopping mall space. And then a lot of noise. And then uh, too many people around. And then the museum is one of the most empty places compared to the other shopping mall and, and, and the shops. So it is a kind of a struggling moment for us. And then we're thinking of even moving out to the, another place from the shopping mall. But it's going to be quite uh, challenging for us to really move out. Because uh, in Chinese system, in a way, as you know, there is no any clear differences or clear cut between the publicness and then the private museum thing or, pri or private understanding, let's say. So sometimes a museum looks like a gallery and gallery looks like a museum. And then there is a even gallery museum. Name itself is gallery museum. So it's going to take time. So I can tell Some you- Some museums are selling art. Exactly. Right. So I can tell you that we'll be struggling uh, for a while, but uh, we'll get better. Dung Guan's an interesting example, because if you go there, an awful lot of the caves are closed, and you can't get up close to the paintings, whereas I, I think what you showed, you could get close-ups, you can get in places you can't go if you go there. So you don't get a real experience, you get a virtual experience, but actually the, the knowledge, and you get perhaps more knowledge out of it than by confronting the actual things. And this is a, becoming more and more a common problem with antiquities and very old things like Lascaux caves. I'm not sure if you can go in them again, but they stopped people going in because just they got too sweaty. There was green stuff growing on them. So now people can't go into them. And um, yeah, do you want to? No, I, I just wanted to say at the Archive of New South Wales, we recently had an exhibition of Tang Dynasty work. And one of the exhibits was a recreation of one of the Dung Huan caves that had been completely recreated as a virtual space. Um, and it was one of those caves that have been closed and it was a conservation project that took place with the University of New South Wales and this new digital technology to record in very, very high definition a cave that is now locked. Any other questions before? Oh. Um, so I had a question for uh, Suhanya. So you said that your gallery in um, South Wales is over undergoing an expansion project um, to double in size. And I've also noticed that a lot of other museums and galleries around the world are doing similar projects, uh, like the Philadelphia Museum of Art, the Hong Kong Museum of Art, um, the Whitney Museum just opened a new location and the MoMA PS1. So I'm just wondering if there's a trend amongst galleries and museums to kind of rebuild, restructure, and rebrand. Uh, what does that mean for the competition amongst museums in the future? Most museum expansions are driven by collections needing to be shown because this repository and some collections are deep and big. Um, are just sitting in storage and it's 
there is this feeling that more, more of those works need to be seen. So a lot of museum expansions are being driven by that. But it's complex. You can see some museum expansions are being driven by major gifts coming in. And um, we've seen it with the Broad. Maybe good, maybe yeah. not. Well, also in um, UEA, in United Arab Emirates, there's Abu Dhabi, where they're on Happiness Islands, the Dayat Island. They're building museums like there's no tomorrow. So they finished the Abu Dhabi Louvre. Um, they're going to start, they say, on the Guggenheim next, the Abu Dhabi Guggenheim. And uh, Noah Foster uh, has built uh, the National Museum, which the British Museum is advertising on them. Now, this is true. Uh, the, the, the spec, not enough room for the collections in the home base, so they want to earn money by renting them out <laughs> to elsewhere. There's also a political will to it because... Um, we sell a lot of arms and other things. Um, the West, I'm talking about U.S. and Europe to the uh, UEA and uh, keeps things sweet. And uh, But I think there's a reason why there aren't uh, museums in the middle of deserts, generally speaking. Um, and it's there's not many people live there. And it's very hot. And it's uh, air conditioning is very difficult and uh, all of that. So it, it is with a great sense of hubris. It's like... Um, uh, Ozymandias in reverse, you know, in the poem Ozymandias, someone comes across this broken down statue from centuries before and looks at this hubris. Here we have things being built, which actually are these cultural monuments out of the sand. But maybe they'll be as uh, mystical and strange as Ozymandias. It's not, not only uh, Abu Dhabi, the Louvre, or uh, National Museum, or British Museum. Uh, the franchising, global franchising business of the major museums in the world is one of the phenomena today. So if you go to, to Shenzhen, there's a Victoria and Albert Museum is, is, is going to uh, build. And also in Pudong, uh, Sohoi district, there's going to be a Sankt Pompidou branch. And then if you go to the Changsha in China, there's going to be another uh, the, the project of one European museum uh, designed by Zaha Hadid and also a very known, globally known Biennale is a franchising to one of city in China, something like that. So that is a, a real questionable question. Well, it's a transfer of capital as the uh, governments of these places cut back money for the museums. They're then put under pressure to find money elsewhere, so they start tarting the collections around to other places, and this is what happens. But that's not going to solve the basic question that the, 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 the home government is not providing enough cash to run these museums in their current form at the moment. And uh, maybe uh, Abu Dhabi will uh, hold out for quite a while until we get renewable energy, and then the oil money will dry up, and then what happens? But it's probably sooner than we think. Thank you all for joining us. I think we've exchanged some interesting ideas about audience building. And on that note, I hope you're all completely engaged with Hong Kong Art Week and go out to see all the shows taking place across the city. Um, Katie, do you have any final words? Final words. <laughs> Um, first of all, I want to say what a wonderful first day we have had. And thank you to all these great speakers and moderators. And <laughs> <laughs> and thank you, Sir David, as well. Um, and uh, many thanks also to Asia Society for this wonderful venue. And, um, you know, I'm, it's, it's re very impressive to see the roster of speakers that we have during these two days. And I must say, it is very gratifying that the Hong Kong Art Gallery Associa Association in just five years is making such an impact in Hong Kong and the region. We can stand proud that our efforts are noticed. There, there are over 100 art events at galleries this week. And um, it's really stepped up many bars. And the influence we are able to spread for the arts in the region is growing. But what does that mean? In closing, I would like to get back to the point of the day. Why does art matter? 
the theme of these two days of talks, and each of our speakers today spoke about how art matters. It seems like a juvenile question, but yes, we still need to question it. However a thriving city Hong Kong is, we put it to question for our youth, our youth who for the most part have been steered away from the arts, yet within their hearts is a yearning, a yearning to step away from the challenge of earning a living and turn to reach deep into their souls to create, to discover, to be curious, and through which to thrive and even make a living. The prick of the heart, the passion to fight, the desire to resist, or just simply to make something for everyone. These are the moments that curiosity and imagination drives creation. It comes from the deepest parts of our soul, not the logical and practical parts, but that inner space that is all our own best friend, should we let it come out. Art looks back through millions of years of human existence, and it looks millions of years towards our future. It is a need, a sustenance, and it looks mi and, uh, and it's to remember that painting that grabbed you, that piece of music that brought a tear to your eye, that installation that shocked you and drove you to continue confusion and questioning. It is part of our existence and one that needs to be embraced because art indeed matters. Now, on a few more notes, there are so many things happening this week. And so you can find the program on the Hong Kong Art Gallery Association website. And uh, there are talks and book launches and uh, something very important, which is the, the, um, the gallery walk for charity. It is our way to give back. It is our first fundraising event. We are starting a fund to help Hong Kong artists pursue artist residency abroad programs. Uh, and as well for art education, and it, as well to help those below the poverty line through the Society of Community Organization, SOCO. So please buy a ticket. <laughs> Thank you.